Welcome to the Side Hustle to Small Business podcast powered by Hiscox. I'm your host, Sanjay Parekh. Throughout my career, I've had side hustles, some of which have turned into real businesses. But first and foremost, I'm a serial technology entrepreneur. In the creator space, we hear plenty of advice on how to hustle harder and why you can sleep when you're dead. On this show, we ask new questions in hopes of getting new answers. Questions like, how can small businesses work smarter? How do you achieve balance between work and family? How can we redefine success in our businesses so that we don't burn out after year three? Every week, I sit down with business founders at various stages of their side hustle to small business journey. These entrepreneurs are pushing the envelope while keeping their values. Keep listening for conversation, context, and camaraderie. Today's guest is Brian Clayton. Brian is the co-founder and CEO of GreenPal, an online marketplace that connects homeowners with local lawn care professionals. GreenPal has been coined the Uber of lawn care. Brian, welcome to the show. Sanjay, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. So uh, I'm excited to talk to you because uh, I got to admit, I don't like lawn care. Uh, I don't like doing it. I appreciate when people do it well, but that is not my forte. But before we start talking about that, tell us a little bit about you and what got you to where you are today. Yeah, so like you said, CEO and co-founder of GreenPal. GreenPal is a nationwide network of lawn care services that you can hire from your smartphone. And GreenPal is a 10-year overnight success. My two co-founders <laughs> and I have been at this for a little over a decade. But now we're nationwide in the United States, around 300,000 people using the app to get lawn mowing every week. And before GreenPal, I actually had a lawn mowing business. I started mowing grass when I was a kid uh, just to make extra cash and stayed with that business all through high school, all through college. Uh, and then uh, when I graduated college and business school, I made a little business plan and over a 15 year period of time, built that into a, a real business, a real company around 150 employees, eventually getting it to around $10 million a year in revenue. And then it was acquired by a, a national landscaping business. And after that, I took some time off and thought, well, somebody's going to build an app that works like Uber, but for lawn mowing, why can't that be me? And I uh, made, made a plan and recruited two co-founders and, and, and never looked back. And now 10 years later, we, we finally have something. So you're one of those rare people that took that entrepreneurial experience as a kid. And you're like, ah, I'm just going to stick with it. Uh, and yeah. Make a business out of it. Luckily, my, my dad made me mow my first yard because I probably would have never gotten started. I think he got tired of watching me play Nintendo all day and, he said, hey, the neighbor says they, they need somebody to cut the grass, so you're going to go do it. And, and uh, that clicked for me. Uh, I got paid 20 bucks for an hour of work, and, and uh, I didn't really intend on being a lawn guy my whole life. Uh, that's not, not why I went to business school. But when I was, <laughs> when I was graduating college, I, I had to make a decision. Was I going to go into the job market or stick with this home services business? And and at the time, I had four or five employees. I was doing around a half million dollars a year in business. I thought, you know what? This could be my lane. It's not really cutting grass. It's more, it's more about sales and systems and processes. And, and that clicked for me again. And so that was kind of maybe level two, level three of the game and made a little business plan and, and uh, started working on it. So have you ever had then a quote unquote real job? I've never had a boss, never had a job. But my boss has always been the customer. And uh, so I guess I'm lucky in that way. I don't think anybody would have ever hired me to do much of anything. So, so I was pretty lucky. <laughs> I was pretty lucky to, to chart my own course. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I have had real jobs, but I think I am uh, sufficiently uh, damaged goods now at this point that I don't, yeah. I'm not sure if, if anybody could hire me at this point or, or would hire me at this point. Yeah, so, hard to go back. It's hard to go back the other way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, okay, so... Obviously, entrepreneurial uh, by nature from early on when, when this whole thing happened. Did you have entrepreneurs in the family that you had as role models or anything like that? Uh, I, I think I'm the first entrepreneur. Uh, I think my, my grandfather, uh, he was an entrepreneur. Um, I, but uh, sadly, he lost everything. Uh, he, he was, he was uh, Cuban and he lost everything when Fidel Castro took over oh. and had to start all over again and never got, really never got back on his feet. So, so some, my, my, my mom tells me that I have some of his DNA in my, in my blood. Uh, <laughs> but, but then uh, my mom and dad were, you know, not entrepreneurs. My dad was in the military and, and my mom was, a, was an English professor. So, so it wasn't like I had that influence in my life other than 
my dad forcing me to 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 basically start my own little first business uh as a as a means of you know trying to push me in the right direction and and to get off my butt and do something and and that just clicked for me uh, where i got a lot of mentorship around small business ownership and and entrepreneurship was starting that first business i was fascinated with the idea of the blue collar millionaire because I was in the construction industry. I was in the home services industry. And I started seeing all around me that the guy that owned the company that repaired garage doors uh, had a lake house. The guy that drove dump trucks delivering dirt everywhere was buying a bunch of rental property. The guy or, or gal that had the, mar- the, 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 the marketing business um, uh, drove a Lexus. And so I started noticing that these people with these little small businesses were actually really successful. And that was validation for me that maybe I could stick with this. This is my lane. And that was fun. That was, that was really neat to see. Yeah. Um, you know, if your dad hadn't pushed you into lawn mowing and yeah, into this no business, <laughs> uh, you could have been a, an e-gaming athlete, right? Like those, <laughs> those folks make a ton of money too. I mean, I think I was way, you know, I wasn't good enough and way too early. You know, <laughs> it'd be, it'd be, we're talking mid nineties here. So, I, so yeah, I was way too early and being too early is the same as being wrong. So thank God he, he did force me. Yeah, you're right. Timing, timing is a lot of everything. So, um, okay. So, uh, you're coming out of business school. You've already got this business then set up. Um, was there anything that made you nervous about, and th- this is prior to this current business that you're doing, anything that made you nervous about doing that? Like, did you have any thoughts of like, Oh, maybe I should just get a real job. It was, it was, uh, it, it, I was nervous for a couple of reasons. I didn't know how to do anything that I was trying to do. There was no YouTube university back then. So, so I was just kind of learning from trial and error. And, and I didn't know that I could scale it into a real company. At the time, I had a couple of employees, but it was, it was very much shoot from the hip and, and, uh, and ad hoc trying to figure out how to get this thing to work. And, and so it was almost a leap of faith. But I, I remember one thing I did was, was back then you, you didn't have, like I said, you didn't have YouTube, but I did mail off uh, a voucher out of a trade magazine for some industry talks from a, uh, from a trade organization. I paid something like a thousand dollars for four cassette tapes. And, and I got these cassette tapes back and I was listening to these talks as I was mowing yards. And, and, uh, these guys were talking about running 30, $40 million businesses in this industry. And I thought, damn, I never even thought that was possible. So that, that opened my eyes to, Hey, if I really knuckle down and make a plan and try to get this thing to maybe 10 or 20 employees, maybe I could get it to a hundred. So that was, that was how I, uh, I guess validated the idea and it helped me take the leap of faith. Yeah. So, uh, moving forward from that then and starting up green pal, um, what was your thought process then? And, and was there something that made you nervous about taking another whack at the, at the ball? Yeah. So it was, it was nerve wracking, but it was easier in many ways. So, so the first thing is, is I, I, I built this landscaping business up and built it into a real company and then got it acquired. So that kind of took some, I took some chips off the table, I guess you could say. I didn't have to, my second company, I could kind of swing for the fences because I didn't have to, 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 to depend on it for sustainability, for, for sustenance, uh, to pay my bills because I did, I, I had enough put back where I didn't have to really work anymore. So that was kind of nice. So, so now I hit a single or a double and, and now I want to really, you know, I want to hit a home run. I want to build something that can touch the mass market. I want to build a business that could potentially have a million customers. So that was one thing that made it easier. Another thing that made it easier was I was kind of with Green Pal solving my own problem. I had spent 15 years in the industry. I'd seen how, how inefficient it runs. I was pretty confident somebody was going to build a platform to make it run as smooth as ordering an Uber. So I, I knew that that was a good idea. But I had never done I had never done a tech business. I had never I had never written any software. I, I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. And also I was naive. Uh, the, in fact, the, the naivete was almost an asset because if if I had ultimately known how challenging it was going to be, I would have never have done it. <laughs> so so that was a good thing. Um, but uh, but I didn't you know I, I just kind of got in there because I knew I wanted to work on something else. I knew I wanted another mission, another project. And I made a decision that no matter what, I was just going to work on my best idea from that moment forward uh, because I had gotten bored and I had gotten a little lazy and I thought I need another mission. 
And, uh, and so that kind of made it easy in a way. But the first three or four years were really challenging getting the business going. Yeah, I, I think that uh, naiveness is the biggest asset of first-time entrepreneurs uh, because I think I had that too when I was doing my first startup, uh, not realizing really how much is going to go into it all and yeah. just diving into it. Um, because honestly, any sane person, if you really understand what is involved, you probably wouldn't do it. It's it's <laughs> just so much. Yeah, I, I get a lot of founders that, or a lot of new founders that, that, that say, hey, I just want... I hate working so hard in my job. I want the good life. I want the easy life. So I want to start a business. And it's actually the inverse. You're going to work twice as hard for half the money for a very long time. Um, but, but if you stick with it long enough, you can build something bigger than just you. And, and so I think that needs to be talked about more. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's about kind of the mission and goal and what you're trying to accomplish. And, and I think if you have a great one of those, the amount of work ends up being not significant, right? Yeah. Like, because you're, you're loving what you do. And it, and it sounds like you love what you do because you were in the landscaping business, you sold it, and then you stuck with the landscaping business. So that, that's kind of the hallmarks of somebody that really loves the business that they're in. So, uh, Talk to me about, uh, you know, you, you kind of touch upon that. You've never done technology. You've never done software. How did you start figuring that out for yourself? And how did you learn the pieces to make this all work? Yeah, that was one of the things that kind of took me by surprise with the second company with building GreenPal was I had built and sold an eight-figure business. So here I am. I think I know everything there is to know about how to get a business going. And, and the thing that caught me by surprise with building GreenPal was, this is totally different because now you're inventing a new product. You're inventing a new solution. You're inventing a new service, something brand new from scratch. And so you have to invent that, create it, bring it to the marketplace, condition the marketplace to use it. And that's a hundred times harder than just going and starting a, a traditional business, which is hard enough on its own. But this is kind of an order of magnitude more difficult. And so that caught me by surprise. And, and then I thought, the hard piece was going to be the technology piece. I thought the hard piece was going to be, okay, well, you know, how are we going to build this thing? How are we going to code this thing? We don't know how to do that. We never built a website. So I thought that was going to be the challenging piece. And, and so that was the first piece that we went to solve. We paid a development shop to build what we thought the first version of GreenPal should be. So my two co-founders and I pulled some money together. And ultimately, we ended up wasting a year and $150,000 doing that. They built what we thought it should be. We released it. It was a total failure. It just barely worked and people didn't understand how to use it and everybody hated it. But that gave us enough validation to understand that it was a good idea because the people that tried it, they told us every which way it sucked and every, every which way that we were, we were terrible entrepreneurs, but they never <laughs> said, they never said, I don't need this. Uh, they were they were upset that it didn't work. They were upset and let down that they couldn't push a button and summon somebody to to mow their yard for them. So that was validation to keep going. And yeah. and 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 the main so we took that that was the main takeaway, validating the idea. And then the second takeaway was, if we're going to be in the tech business, we're going to have to learn how to build software. Um, it's kind of like saying uh, I I want to start a restaurant, but I don't know how to cook. Uh, and I and I've never never cooked anything in my life, and so. Uh, that was uh, that was a hard lesson to learn. But my two co-founders and I, we we went to YouTube University. My one of my co-founders went to a software boot camp, and over it took a year. But we learned just enough to to be dangerous, and we rebuilt the whole thing from scratch uh, with the feedback from the early adopting users. And that's still the same platform we're iterating on today, ten years later. Wow, that's awesome. Um, so you know, one thing that kind of strikes me with the platform that you've built. Um, is that at least in the early days, you had this catch-22 chicken and egg problem, right? How do you get the people that do the landscaping on there if you don't have the customers that are going to need that? And how do you get the customers if you don't have the landscaping companies on there? So how did you figure that out for yourself? Yeah, it's a challenging, uh, one of the most challenging pieces of, of building a marketplace is solving that that cold start problem. It's, right. it's not useful to the other side if the other side's not on there. And so, and so what do you do? And, yeah. and uh, for us, we, we kind of had to hand crank it for a very long time. And, and so we spent our first three years in one city. 
Nashville, Tennessee, where, where we live. And we knew there was no reason to launch it in a different market if we couldn't get it humming and working in Nashville, in our own backyard. Mm. So it took f- literally three years to, to figure all of that out. And so the way we did it was we, we hand-cranked the supply side, the, the, the lawn care professionals, and got that to a point where it was just good enough. And then we went to market to the consumer side and, and figured if we could just get enough overlap that eventually a flywheel would take place. And, and that took three years to, to figure out. And then the second market we, we launched was Atlanta. That took another year. And then our third market was Tampa. That took six months. And then as time went, as time went on, we, we, we developed the playbook for, okay, this is how we recruit the first handful of, of lawn care services, vet them kind of keep them interested just long enough to where we can then go market to consumers, get them on. And, and then, and then we create a, a little bit of a, uh, of a chain reaction of events with, with, with introducing buyers and sellers. And there's a really good book about this now called the cold start problem by, by Andrew Chen. Back then there was no book. So we kind of, just <laughs> we kind of just, uh, we kind of just like slogged our way through it until we figured out what worked. Yeah. W- was there anything that was the aha moment in all of that of like, oh, this is the key learning to making all of this work. There, in, 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 in 10 or 12 years, there, there has been no like one move on the chessboard that's won the game for us. Um, there hasn't been any aha moments. There's just been a lot of punches in the stomach. And, <laughs> and so, so and, and, and that slug in the stomach kind of gives you an epiphany, gives yeah. you an aha moment. So, one of the first like punches to the gut was I started this company from the from the mindset of a contractor of a lawn care professional, mm-hmm. uh, thinking that that uh, my competitors were hungry, that they wanted all the business we could feed them, and that they would just they would just devour all of the demand uh, that we that we channeled to them, and one of the one of the big uh, just. <laughs> epiphanies was no they they don't care <laughs> they they are apathetic about about getting all of this new business that is actually so much more than that you have to solve you have to solve problems around routing crm um get uh, uh account receivable getting paid quickly marketing automation you have to solve all of these problems at the same time as well as get them new business and and so that was one of the things that was really surprising to me was all of the reasons that it sucks to hire a lawn guy are now my problem. I have to solve <laughs> them. I have to figure out how to solve them with technology. And, and so, and so here I am 15 years, built the landscape company, sold it, started all over again, taught myself how to code. My two co-founders did too. And I'm still in the lawn mowing business. I'm still, I'm still trying to figure out why did Peter and a pickup not show up at Mrs. Smith's house on, on Thursday and mow it for $35. Or, or he, maybe he did, and he didn't mow the backyard. Or maybe he did, he mowed the backyard, but he forgot to blow off the back patio or, or whatever. All these million reasons that makes it right. difficult to get this done are now my problem. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're doing a great sales job for listeners to tell them to become entrepreneurs. I mean, you know, the, the gut punch, that's, uh, I mean, we got people converting right now. Yeah, uh-huh. Well, it's important. It's important people know that, right? <laughs> I think I think Elon Musk said... Uh, I think Elon Musk or somebody else said that 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 entrepreneurship is like uh it's like it's like chewing glass, but you become to love the taste of your own blood. And uh <laughs> it really is kind of what it's like. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And and uh, you know, that all said, there are those times when you win and man, those highs cannot oh, yeah. be higher. Um but then the alternate is when things go bad, man, those lows are very low and they're they're tough. To get through. So totally. Um, really uh, great to have other entrepreneurs around you. So you've got two co-founders. Do you do anything in, te- in terms of a support system? Do you have other founders you talk to? Um, how do you like think through challenges that you're, you're facing? Yeah. In the early days, what got us through a lot of the, the, the hard times in the, in, in the early years was uh, really a benevolence to your co-founders. It's like, hey, I've got two other guys in the trenches with me here. I have to show up and give it my all every day because they're staking their lives on this as well. And that kind of benevolence to your co-founder to not let your co-founder down creates this kind of like almost like a band of brothers type of dynamic where it's, where it's like, hey, I know they're giving it their all. I'm going to give it my all. And that kind of 
wills the company into existence and and uh creates this 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 dynamic of of we we've burnt the boats like success is the only option and so and so that was helpful um as time has gone on and things are not as 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 dire as they were in the early years it, it's not like it's not like running this this company is easy but it's a lot easier than it was back then um now now I I have to artificially kind of uh, inject that into into my into my journey and so I I do have a a, a little network of other uh, marketplace fa- co-founders that 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 have their own kind of uh journey and trials that that I share war stories with and and also tactical things um for example like organic SEO is my specialty and so I I try to bring I try to bring that mindset to the, to the group and then they, and then I've got other guys that are good at conversion rate optimization or design and, and I learn from them so I think that's important to have that tribe of people that are doing what it is you're trying to do hmm. that you can learn from and and use as your little support system. Yeah, that's awesome. Um okay, uh let's talk uh switch gears a little bit um and talk about setting boundaries cuz the work that you're in, like there's lawn mowing happening all the time, seven days a week, and there's probably problems in the business happening all the time. So how do you think about setting boundaries for yourself between the business and personal life and, and all the other things that keep you sane and happy? For me, it's probably not a, a super uh, politically correct answer, but for me, the, the, there are none. If you're, if you're go- really going to get something going from scratch, it's, it, it's, you are your business, your business is you. And I think it's a myth and that is that a lot of new founders kind of fall victim to that, uh, that they're going to be able to, to start this business and breathe life into it from the same disposition as they work their job. If you're starting, this is your first business, it's going to be a, a full contact sport. It's going to be seven days a week. Uh, you're going to be waking up in the morning and, and in the shower thinking about your business to the moment that your head hits the pillow, you're thinking about the business. And, and the yeah. reason is, is because you're doing three things at once at all times. You're working in the business, just trying to keep it going. You're working on the business, coming up with the systems, processes, strategies, the routines. And then the third thing is, is you're working on yourself. You're learning copywriting. You're learning um, conversion rate optimization. You're learning design or whatever it is, whatever the block and tackling is. And there's just seven days a week. There's there's just there's just not enough time for all of those things. And so <laughs> I think the first three or four years is no boundaries. It's all in, and and that's just the way it is. And that's the way I have experienced it now twice. Is that 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 it took that to get the business going? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I have a, a similar experience as you, like to me, there really is no boundaries, but I mean, there are some boundaries, right? You know, on vacation, you try to, to peel back a little bit, but you still got to pay attention to things and make sure things get done. After you get it going. Yeah. I, I, I mean, now, now we've got a team of 40, 50 people and, and we're profitable and we're doing well. I mean, yeah, I'm able to turn it off at times, but those first three or four years, yeah, I, I just don't know. I don't know that it's possible. Yeah, it, it it is very tough, and and I think you um your answer actually points to another thing is that it's better to do these things the earlier in your career in life than later because you just build up a bigger burn, yeah. personal burn as you as you get older. I mean, because of life things, right? Like families and houses and mortgages and and all of those things. So. Uh, if you're thinking about doing this, it's better to do it today rather than tomorrow. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's a myth and bad advice that's perpetrated onto um, younger people in their 20s or maybe even 30s that you've got time to figure it out. Uh, Colonel Sanders was 55 when he started KFC and uh, – <laughs> You know, and, and the list goes on. And uh, 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 Sam Walton was was fifty three when he started Walmart. Sam Walton was was in retail in his twenties. Okay, like th- that. That is bad advice. I mean, that is terrible advice. Like you know, your twenties are your time to lay a foundation and and to get on first base. So then you can get on second or third base in your thirties, and then you can swing for the fences in your forties. So it's bad advice to to say that you've got time and, and just to take it easy. Don't worry about it. Trust the process. I, I can't stand when I hear these, these uh, social media gurus um, giving that advice because it's bad advice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's uh, 
switch gears a little bit, although this is somewhat related to what we were just talking about. Do you have like any kind of uh, routine, daily routine, like making sure you go to bed at a certain time, exercise? Like wh- what does your day look like in terms of that? I love uh, one of my favorite books, Atomic Habits. And, and, and I love the quote from Atomic Habits is that we don't, we don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall back to the level of our, of our routines, of our habits. And so it's like, sh- uh, you know, uh, show me your habits. I'll show you your future. It, it, you can say this a hundred different ways. And, and that goes for your personal life, whether you're trying to lose weight or pay off credit card debt or whatever it is. But it also goes into your business life. It's, it's what are the routines of the business? What are the, what are the things that you lay out uh, that you have to do in a given week? And I call them, I call them trip wires. And, and I particularly have to lay out trip wires in front of me and for things that I don't personally like to do. I hate staring at data. I hate spreadsheets. I hate going over the minutia of, of where traffic is coming from and how things are converting. So I purposely pay somebody who's really good at this uh, a, you know, a, a lot of money that hurts me <laughs> at, that I have to meet with every Thursday at one thirty, And, and when she's got everything ready, I better have done my homework and I can come to that weekly meeting prepared and I've, and I have done all the things I hate to do. So that's a trip wire that I have to trip over every single week that kind of holds us accountable, a forcing function. And, and so I try to do that and organize my day and my week like that. And I try to stick with the same routines, um, on a daily and weekly basis. And so then, you know, six months, a year goes by and, and I'm in a different, I'm in a different world. I'm in a different reality because of, of these daily and weekly things. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, okay. Uh, you've now had the, the benefit of doing two separate companies, uh, scaling two separate companies. You've learned a lot now. Looking back at something that you've done in the past, like knowing what you've known now, learn, you know, having learned all of this stuff, is there something you, you would do differently based on today's knowledge, not what you knew back then? Yeah, it, it would be... Uh, so this, this kind of paradox of delegation and, and, uh, de- understanding the difference between delegating too early and delegating too late. And, and so I've made both of these mistakes. And at times, every time I've ever tried to delegate something that I don't have kind of like the Pareto principle down on the 80, 20 down, um, where, where I don't even have like the, the 99 one, <laughs> you know, like I don't know how to run a Facebook campaign. So I'm going to delegate it to somebody. And that always blows up in my face. So I delegated too soon. And so then the, the problem is, is, okay, well, now I'm going to run the Facebook campaign myself. And, right. then I, and then I run it four years. And it's like, okay, you delegated too late. You should have, you should have delegated that uh, when, you, when you had the Pareto principle down. So this idea of, of uh, you, you do it yourself, you get the 80-20 down, and then delegate. Rinse and repeat. And, and day one, you, know, you build out an org chart, and there's – there's head of customer service, there's head of R&D, there's head of accounting, there's head of legal, there's head, and, and it's your name on all these roles and you're doing all this stuff, you know, as much as best you can. And then as time goes on, you, you, you've learned the 80, 20 of each of these roles. You can then delegate it to somebody who focuses on it. Um, and, and the lazy thing to do is just to continue to do it yourself because it's actually quite difficult work to delegate it. And so holding yourself accountable to do the difficult work, setting up a procedure, setting up a, uh, a, a, a way, uh, a, a process to delegate to somebody else is difficult. And, and I would have beat into my head 20 years ago to hold myself accountable to do that, to, to, to set up, set up a, 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 a framework around me and to get people who are smarter to focus on things rather than just, just doing it all myself for a long time. Yeah. Where do you find the issue of, of, like you said, the, the Facebook campaign, you delegated it. Um, you didn't even know 1% of it. Well, like, where is your issue of not knowing enough there? Is it that you think you f- end up finding somebody who also doesn't know it and you don't realize it? Like where, where's the pitfall in that? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, so the obvious things are you don't know, you don't know how to do it. You don't know what success looks like. You don't know how much it should cost all these things. But, mm-hmm. but the way, the way I kind of like to look at it is, is, uh, you have, you have delegation from stewardship and delegation from abducation. And so delegation from, from a standpoint of abducation is I don't know how to do it. I hate doing it. I tried to do it. I couldn't figure it out. It sucks. I don't want to do it. You handle it. And like that never works. 
what what you want to say is what you want to say is okay. Well, we need you to run a a, a Facebook campaign. Here here's here's what, what the what the brand standards are. Here is our tone of copywriting. Here is uh the our past performance on 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 things that I've done. Here is your benchmarks that we want you to beat what I what it is that I've done. Here is here is the creative that I've done and what's worked and what 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 hasn't and how we want you to improve. Um, here is here is uh, uh, the copywriting courses I've taken and and how I want you to kind of match that and improve on that. And here's what success looks like. Here's how long we think it should take for you to do, and here's what we think it should cost. And here's how we're going to gauge whether this was a, a success or a failure. That's that's, st- that's that's delegation from a stewardship standpoint. And and you always want to delegate from a position of stewardship and not abdication because abdication, one or two things is going to happen. Uh, it's going to be a failure or you're going to get lucky. And uh, and luck is not a, not, <laughs> it's not a strategy. Yeah. It, it, it reminds me of the story you told a little bit ago of hiring the software development firm right, same thing. for a hundred and eight because you didn't know what it should cost, how it should work or right. any of those things. And you abdicated your responsibility there and, and ended up not working. Is total, that- total failure, lost, lost 150 grand of our cash and even worse, lost a year of our time. Right. Because we kind of got lucky in a sense that Uber for lawn care was not something that somebody was going to beat us to kind of like, like, like <laughs> Uber for ride sharing. That was a very competitive battle between Uber and Lyft and four others. Like it was a land grab, right? We were not in a land grab situation. Had we been in a land grab losing that year would have, would have been the end of it. So I kind of got yeah. lucky there that, that I was in a, I was in a space that, that afforded me that kind of sloppiness. Yeah. Uh, Brian, listen, this has been fantastic. Where can our listeners find and connect with you online? Yeah, uh, LinkedIn's a great place to find me. Instagram, uh, Brian M. Clayton, a great place to find me. Just drop me a DM on either of those. And then anybody wants to check out GreenPal, just go to greenpal.com. Awesome. Thanks so much for being on today. Thanks for having me on. I enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Side Hustle to Small Business podcast powered by Hiscox. To learn more about how Hiscox can help protect your small business through intelligent insurance solutions, visit Hiscox.com. That's H-I-S-C-O-X dot com. And if you have a story you want to hear on this podcast, please visit Hiscox.com slash share your story. I'm your host, Sanjay Parikh. You can find out more about me at my website, sanjayparik.com.